you wabarakatuh and a very good morning to, to our viewers especially those who are outside UM outside Kuala Lumpur so thank you very much for taking the time to be with us this morning so we are going to talk on uh, uh, we are going to share on food security through sustainable and organic aquaculture we are going to have three academic academicians who are experts in this area however i believe they are expert in many other areas as well so before we proceed further i would like to share briefly on the objective of this webinar so this webinar is one of the platforms uh, for researchers within and outside um to share the outcome of their interdisciplinary research project mainly the interdisciplinary uh, IIRG program to other institutions, industry, committees, communities, agencies, stakeholders, and anyone who is interested. So before we proceed further, I would like to introduce our speaker. So our first speaker this morning is Associate Professor in Senior Dr. Pubalan Ganesan, who is actually from Department of Mechanical Engineering Faculty of Engineering University Malaya. So Dr. Pubalan received his bachelor's degree in Mechanical Engineering from University of Technology Malaysia, Kudai in 1999 and eventually received his PhD degree in fluid mechanics and heat transfer from the University of Aberdeen, Scotland in 2010. Dr. Pubalan also has industry experience as a process and product engineer at IY Electronic Sendirian Berhad Malaysia and is also actively involved with community related projects such as a knowledge transfer programs and activities on urban aquaculture farming. So let's start with our first speaker. Uh, we will start soon with our first speaker. So our second speaker will be Dr. Nor Hidayah Muhammad Taufi, who is from Institute of Biological Sciences, Faculty of Science, also from University of Malaya. And shortly we will be having Associate Professor Dr. Gyo Wan Anitan, who, will, who is also from Institute of Biological Sciences, Faculty of Science, University Malaya. So shall we begin our session this morning, Dr. Pubalan, as our first speaker? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So shall I share my screen? Yes, please. Sorry, I unable to share my screen. It's all right. So we will share your we will we will share the slides for you. Is that all right, Dr. Pubalan, on our side here as the organizer? Yeah. Okay. Talk just a moment, please. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, madam, I unable to hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we proceed further, I would like to introduce Dr. Nor Hidayah Muhammad Taufik, our second speaker, who shall be our second speaker. So, Dr. Nor Hidayah Muhammad Taufik is a senior lecturer at the Institute of Biological Science, UM. In 2017, she earned her doctorate in biotechnology and biochemistry, specializing in aquaculture nutrition from the from Institute UM. Her current work focuses on finding environmental, environmentally friendly options for feeding monogastric animals like fish, chicken, and rabbit. So she also has a background in fish nutrition and is now working with industries to develop sustainable animal formulated feed using locally renewable resources, including black soldier fly larvae and cricket meal, as well as mushroom byproducts and underutilized crops. So Dr. Nokhidaya also is also pushing for adoption of circular bioeconomics and she is also doing so in part by advocating for the use of black soldier flies as a protein to provide 
affordable and sustainable feed. So that actually is also in line with our theme today, which is food security through sustainable and organic aquaculture. So Dr. Nohidayah now is working on urban farming project to encourage the mainstreaming of fish production in urban settings via a social community engagement initiative called Urban Aqua at UM. And her initiative is now being implemented at Ladang Mini ISB where she serves as a coordinator. So to those of you who are in UM, you might want to drop by and look around and see what's going on at our Ladang Mini ISB. Please feel free to do so. All right, so uh, we will be back shortly. However, please stay in line that we are going to share Dr. Pubalan's slide. Just a moment. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pubalan, uh, sorry, uh, thank you very much for your time. Is it possible that you try to broadcast your screen once again? Because we have already changed the setting. Uh, I think it's okay now. All Can right. you see? Yes, doctor. It would be good if it is in a slide mode. Thank oh. you. So you may begin, doctor. Okay. Uh, very good morning to uh, everyone there, uh, professors, uh, doctors. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just to reintroduce myself again, my name is Pubalan uh, from uh, Department of Mechanical Engineering, University Malaya. And uh, today I'm uh, going to present uh, a top, uh, a topics on uh, micro or nano bubble technology for aquaculture aeration. So moving on. So what I'm showing you here is uh, traditional common or traditional aquaculture farming in Malaysia. So what do you see on your uh, left now? This is, uh, this is uh, like, uh, it's called like cage method, whereby all the fish are inside uh, individually section according to the cage. Uh, it is clear here on the, on the bottom left corner. And the other, other thing is that this is an earth pond. Uh, sometimes, uh, most often, the earth pond is uh, also uh, lined with the liner, HTP liner. So, what are the problem with our traditional practices? So, we have uh, issues like uh, water pollution, uh, a very unpredicted climate change, which causes a massive uh, fish death. Uh, this always happens. You can see here and there from newspaper as well. So every time this happens, there, there, there will be a big loss to the farmers and a lot of stress there. Uh, and then the, the fish will die. All of them will die at the one shot. This is the major problem with uh, what we are having with our traditional practice of uh, aquaculture farming. So the future direction uh, of uh, aquaculture farming is uh, more towards uh, going into a uh, super intensive or indoor aquaculture farming. What you are seeing here, the pictures are here, is uh, can be a very controlled environment, uh, tank base. There's a lot of tanks here. Uh, the water qualities are controlled, and then by then we can uh, have a very high density stocking. Meaning is you can put more number of fish for for culture. And then we can also include a recirculation aquaculture system, which means the water can be uh, cleaned and reused back, uh, resulting a minimum uh, or reduced water waste. So another technology that, uh, that is quite popular now, we call it bioflock technology. What is the meaning of it is uh, we, we, put, uh, we put a lot of uh, uh, good bacteria, which you see here, uh, many types of good bacteria into the water uh, in order to convert the waste of ammonia into a less harmful uh, form, NO3, which you can see here. So ammonia convert to NO2 and then further down to NO3. And then all the uh, microorganism is also consumed by either by the prawn or the fish as a supplement food. So bioflock technology is also uh, regarded as a blue revolution technology. 
so moving on we are yeah so one of the key uh, element uh, is about uh, aquaculture is aeration uh, which you uh, we, aeration and the aeration technology and then what you are seeing here is an example of paddle wheel which agitate the water on the surface of the pond as you can see in the figure here the picture here so other type of uh, aeration technology is uh, shown here is this is called a, pro, a propeller type where it is uh, it's a propel is rotated like a turbine where a lot of uh, mixing of the air and the water will occur at the at the, these locations this is again to aerate the water uh, another type is we call it a jet aerator uh, car, the mechanism is almost the same so we have a, you have a palm and then uh, the water and air is mixing and then outlet is here. So moving on, this is uh, what I'm showing you here is a type of micro bubble generator. The name is micro bubble generator. Uh, it's a product of Japan and the purpose is to, to release a bubble at the size of micro, very small size. The scale of it is very small size. So what 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 is the purpose we we want to increase? Uh, why we want to have the aeration for the water is is to increase the dissolved oxygen of the water. Uh, we want the more oxygen in the water. The purpose is having a more oxygen in the water, which we measure uh, using the unit of ppm parts per million. Uh, you can see that the range it ranges from uh, between four to maybe up to ten. So having a higher value, say above seven, you can stock more fish. Uh, uh, that means you can have more stocking density for the same size of the tank. More number of fish can be cultured. That is the main reason why we want to increase the aeration level as well the dissolved oxygen in the tank. So the man that you are seeing over here is uh, using a system or instrumentation which is called a dissolved oxygen meter, uh, which, uh, which can give you the readings between uh, 0 to 10 ppm. So moving on. So uh, as a fundamentally, uh, the aeration uh, as a uh, as a uh, direct connection to the bubble size, uh, air bubble size. Let's uh, look at the characteristic of uh, air bubble size, uh, where I define by three scale here the size of the uh, diameter of the air bubble, uh, where the first one we call it nano scale, nanometer scale. And then uh, bigger, slightly bigger to that, we call we categorize it as a micro bubble scale. And then the common one is a micro bubble, macro bubble. So it is in a millimeter or cm. Uh, so having uh, the having having a smaller size will bring uh, certain advantages, and there are some other disadvantages as well. So let's look uh, uh, briefly. Uh, what is the benefit having a bubble at the size of the uh, nanoscale? So the internal pressure of the internal pressure of the bubble itself is very high, uh, which which give a very strong, a very good physical stability within the water. That means that the the bubble will be suspended in the water for a very long time. Uh, they will be retained there, which uh, improve the dissolved oxygen of the water. But unlike the small scale here, if you look at the on the opposite side, which is a macro scale, which is the higher scale, the bigger scale of the bubble, they quickly raise up. You can see the line there, the line that you can see, the bubble will be uh, will raise up very fast to the sur top surface of the water and burst on the tap uh, on the top. So we cannot achieve a very high dissolved uh, oxygen where the mass transfer, the transfer, mass transfer is poor here. 
So we will achieve a low uh, dissolved oxygen for macro scale bubble compared to the nano scale. The micro scale uh, serve in between this uh, nano and macro where they suspended, but uh, will take a slightly longer period of time to raise up to the top. You can see the line that goes uh, oscillating left to right, and then it slowly goes up to the top. Now, this is the fundamental characteristics of uh, size of the bubbles. So let's look at the uh, the basic idea of the of the application part of the three scale of the bubble that I've talked about just now. Nano bubble, micro scale bubble, and the uh, macro, or I say the traditional. This is the traditionally used. So you can see the first thing, which is electricity consumption or energy consumption, where we, where, whereby we normally run our aeration pumps for 24 seven, uh, 24 hours and seven days. For nano bubbles, uh, the electricity consumption, so uh, where we need to use high pressure pump or mechanisms, the electricity consumption is very high compared to the traditional is very low. On the other hand, you can see that the uh, the DO uh, the DO is a bit much better for nano nano scale compared to the micro scale. So in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of how much the bubble, look at the uh, water depth coverage or bubble suspension in the water, how long the bubble can stay or last in the water, the nano's bubble will, will be within the water volume or suspended within the wa water volume for a period of a long time, whereby the macro scale will quickly raise up to the surface. They don't suspend. Uh, this is the basic characteristic there. So let's move on uh, to the next slide. So what then? Uh, what is the selection criteria of the aeration technology? So we need to look at. We need to understand the purpose of the application of the aquaculture. So why we are you using it for breeding purpose, or a grow out pond size? or the, is it a speci specific treatment to the culture species? So based on this, you need to decide what type of aeration technology you, are, you want to choose, either nano, micro, or macro. And then cost plays a bigger factor there, Prod uh, initial cost, product cost, as, as well as electricity cost. And then followed by the size of the pond and the tank. Obviously, if you are to looking into a very large tank, uh, traditional uh, will will come into the be, uh, better condition because the tank size is very 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 big or the pond itself is very big. Uh, then move on to the type of the culture species and its market value. If we, we are talking about culturing very very expensive uh, uh, species, maybe we can, should uh, consider very advanced aeration uh, uh, technology like uh, nano or micro. Uh, aeration technologies. So, but uh, cons uh, the recommendation normally from me is uh, the, to use a hybrid application, combination between macro and micro. Uh, that will be uh, ideal to, to, to have a better productivity as well to save the cost. So yeah, uh, this slide is uh, give some uh, uh, introduction on the all the work that we have done at University of Malaya R and D prototype of micro bubble generator generators. So we basically we try to develop a generator in house, which can create the micro bubbles. Uh, let me show you some video to give you some idea. Uh, what is the micro bubble? So if you see the video here. Uh, the whitish, uh, the micro bubble appear whitish in color. And then this whitish uh, eventually will disappear as the micro bubbles uh, disappear from the water. They, the water again will become to the uh, normal color. So this is the micro bubbles. So I show you. Okay, so I'm showing you another video there. So you can see the smaller bubbles uh dispersed from this uh exit here the from this nozzle you can see all the bubbles here so they are they are move along the water 
suspended within the water uh, with this another aeration technology that we have at University of Malaya. Then I'm moving so, so to the basic uh, prototype of the Venturi nozzle bubble generator. Basically, the basic mechanism is uh, we have our, uh, on your right hand side, we have a water, uh, sorry, on our left hand side, we have water inlet. And then the air is coming from the top of the nozzle side. And the mixing is happen at the region called throat. Uh, some of the mixing is happening here. And then after mixing, we have the outlet where air and the water after mixing will be channeled out from, uh, from the nozzle. This is how we create uh, uh, micro bubbles uh, for our tanks, which I have showed you before. Uh, this is uh, an experimental setup in order to understand the characteristic of the bubble. Uh, basically, the water coming uh, flowing from the left to the right. And then we have the nozzle here, venturi nozzle there. So uh, air is coming from the top, from the needle valve through the flow meter. Water is coming from the left to the right. And then the outcome of the mixing will be channeled to the transparent tube. And then we have a high-speed camera here in order to capture the, the, the characteristic of the bubbles, the size of the bubbles, which you can see on your right uh, bottom left, there's an image of the bubble, how actually they are uh, distributed. Uh, as you can see, yeah, mm, this is what uh, some of the uh, detailed measurement we do at the, our, our site in order to assess the performance of the Venturi bubbles, Venturi generator. Uh, what I'm showing you now is a computational fluid dynamic simulation. It is a, it's a modeling work or simulation work whereby, uh, whereby you try to assess or try to understand how actually the flow between the water uh, in a parameter like a velocity and pressure, which actually flowing from right to left after the nozzles. Uh, as you can see, the color, the green color, the velocity is a bit high. Then you can see the real, the air is coming from the top and then try to do to, to get mixed up with the water on the top. Uh, this is to further understand the flow characteristic and also to further improve the geometry of the nozzle that we are trying to develop. Uh, we also tested our 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 technologies using uh, different types of tank. So what you are seeing here is a small size of tanks. Uh, it's a very small size of tank, whereby we we tested with the culture called uh, is a white lake stream or with a little piece Vietnamese. Uh, there you can see this is the white stream. We call it white stream, white lake stream. Then uh, we put uh, we stock in uh, PL fourteen. Uh, post larvae at the 14 into the into the this tank and then we culture for a period of 30 days to see the growth we found that the uh, uh, we found that the do the growth of the of the culture increased by 30 percent under the nursery stage we further tested uh, the the growth of the white stream using a medium scale tank because we want to upscale the size. As you can see now, that this is a, this is a, about about five, five ton of a tank. Uh, the whitish is because of the micro bubbles. It's a micro bubbles. So you can see water surface. Uh, it's a bit uh, whitish because of the impact of the micro bubbles. And again, we found that. Uh, the DO as well, the growth is increased 30%, which confirms our initial testing. We also tested in a very, quite a big tank. We built a 20 to a ton of water tank. We built up a very big one. And then we tested with the Malaysian uh, Udang Gala, a giant fresh water prawn. We tested with that. Uh, there you can see some of the pictures here. So we have a male prawn. Uh, this is a mono species uh, uh, udangala. 
uh, then after uh, after a period of uh, 70 days we check back the size and the length this here so i share some video there basic a simple video of the udangala All right, and then we also tested with the another type of fish. It is called jade purse fish, uh, which believed to have a high omega three fatty acid uh, content. Uh, we, we we cultured, we harvested. Uh, it is about uh, about uh, one one about near about one kg, eight hundred gram to nine hundred gram. Uh, jade perch fish. We we tested with that. Uh, apart from the uh, data collection, we also uh, conduct some uh, series of trainings. Uh, we also allow students to come and uh, join us, uh, visit our the facilities as well to learn about the technologies. These are the pictures. Uh, we had a student from uh, Kuantan, IIUM from Kuantan, including their lecturers. Uh, one of the uh, activities that I'm doing uh, also is uh, for community uh, projects, uh, which we call it a knowledge transfer program. Uh, this is a setup that we develop at the section three, uh, Pataling Jaya, where we have uh, two 10, uh, inch, uh, 10 feet of water tank. Uh, the culture is tilapia. Uh, using uh, aeration technology as well the uh, uh, bioflox technology uh, the one standing here is uh, adun uh, zone uh, zone 5 pataling jaya puan emma mari mariana uh, i guess uh, that's all from my side uh, uh, so last from me is i'm affiliated to uh, center of uh, energy science as well as well center of uh, advanced material my name is here again, uh, Pubalan. So these are the services we are provided, uh, providing uh, consultation on uh, aquaculture aerations, basic training on bioflox, uh, culture method of a uh, white stream, udangala, jade perch. Uh, also, we provide training on the water quality testing method uh, for aquaculture purpose. Thank you very much from me. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Associate Professor in Senior Dr. Pubalan Ganesan. Okay, so uh, Dr. Pubalan, so basically from what you have presented, the setup cost is comparably lower than the conventional uh, setup or technology, right? However, the operation cost might be slightly higher, but it covers a larger area which is involved. Is that correct, Dr. Pubalan? Uh, correct, yeah, what you are saying is uh, correct, yeah. Okay. As, so I, you, as yeah. I mentioned earlier, uh, the pond size uh, is uh, is really matters. If you are talking about very big ponds, uh, it is uh, for now it's uh, it's still better to opt for the traditional method. But if you are moving to a very uh, intensive culture where you have uh, very controlled uh, uh, condition, smaller pond size. Uh, then we can use um, uh, like a micro bubble aeration technology or nano bubble aeration technology. Yeah, I see. All right, that's very interesting. So we can discuss further, or perhaps you can share further later. We are All going right. to give you another slot to sum up. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Pubalan. Now, you, moving you. on uh, to our second speaker this morning, uh, that is Associate Professor Dr. Gyok Wan Yuan Annie Tan. All right, um, she is from Institute of Biological Science, Faculty of Science University Malaya, and her focus is on actinobacterial systematics and environmental microbiome studies. So Dr. Annie, which is more friendly to be known as, uh, she is currently collaborating with other biologists and engineers on the application of microbes for sustainable aquaculture. Something new, a German to me, but very interesting to know further. So over to you, Dr. Annie.
Okay, to our viewers who are online via YouTube, you may key in any questions. Don't worry, there is no such thing as silly questions. Any simple questions will do because as our main objective of having this webinar is to welcome the public to share knowledge as well as to share the transfer of technology, not only to researchers within University of Malaya, among other different institutions as well as beyond academia. So what we plan to do is we hope that we can attract the interest of the general public, especially those who are from the industries, from the ministries as well as other bodies to be able to adapt to the technology proposed by our researchers. So our researchers, what do they do is they aim to create technologies and thus create impacts to the industry, especially the aquaculture industry. So from what I have read recently, in the year 2022, the aquaculture is actually about 14.3% of the industry in the, statics, uh, in the statistics, the study done. So from there, we can see there is a lot of opportunities and areas that can be developed further from the combination of our expertise as well as from the industries. Later on, how we can see this thing, these uh, components can be combined to be able to create more economic advancements as well as benefits to both party, the university, in terms of the society, as well as to the country, how we can elevate uh, the status to the international level in the aspect of aquaculture. So now uh, Dr. Puba, sorry, and now Dr. Annie, are you ready Dr. Annie? Dr. Annie? Okay, so Dr. Annie, so you may begin over to you. Right. Can you hear me? Yes, clear, Doctor. Thank you. So sorry uh, about the technical abilities. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, clearly, but it would be great if you can project it in a slide mode, Doctor. Presentation uh, mode, sorry. Is that better? Yes, thank uh, you very much. Right, thank you so much. I'm going to speak on bacteria for healthy water in Jake Pledge aquaculture. And um, this um, study is um, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Kubalan as well as uh, Dr. Hidaya, who will be speaking um, after this. So um, to introduce a little bit about Jade Perch aquaculture, um, it's a freshwater uh, spin fish species, um, scientifically known as Scotum Baku. And, um, it is a hardy fish uh, and grows very fast. It reaches market size uh, within seven months. Um, and it's uh, although it's native in, to Australia, it is now commonly farmed in Australia, Malaysia, and China. It enjoys a high demand in domestic and international markets and value for its taste, texture, and nutritional qualities. One of the main challenges of jade perch agriculture um, is the water quality. Uh, so our research uh, here focus on um, checking, uh, assessing the water quality as well as um, the bioflock. Um, let me introduce um, what's the what's the system. is a sustainable method to control water quality um, and there, with an added value of producing proteinaceous feed in situ. Shown in the picture is a microscopic uh, observation of bioflock. Um, what this technique uh, ratio in the uh, water um, and by doing that we can um, also uh, maintain um, certain um, 
microorganisms um, that help um, in nutrient cycling as well as um, remediation um, of the waste in the water. So uh, bioflock, as the term uh, biology, bio is, is in this word, uh, is mainly made up of biological um, microorganisms. The key players are bacteria, microalgae, and zooplankton, among other microorganisms. So um, for our study here, we focus on bacteria because it's um, the predominant uh, microorganism uh, found in bioflock. So bacteria takes up inorganic nitrogenous waste and uh, incorporates it into the biomass. And then this forms the bioflocks in the water. And um, as we mentioned, uh, the benefits of bioflocks that we have seen um, are maintaining water quality as well as um, in itself, it's a source of nutrients for the fish uh, as well as streams um, in aquaculture. So the nutritionist waste um, normally comes from the unconsumed uh, feed and fish uh, excretion. Um, and by having this system in aquaculture, uh, in directly it also allows for high density aquaculture and a minimal or zero water exchange because um, you don't have to throw out uh, the dirty water, okay? Uh, because the bacteria is going to uh, use the waste and um, incorporate it into the bioflocks to become uh, another uh, source of nutrients for the animals. Let me introduce to you um, the nutrient cycle, uh, uh, basically the nitrogen cycle uh, in aquaculture. Uh, which includes mainly the nitrification and the denitrification process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, made up of microorganisms as well as uh, some of the nitrogenous wastes that are from unconsumed feed and animal excretion. And the more uh, waste that's produced, um, the more ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate uh, will be. Um, produced in the system, okay? And um, this is toxic to um, the fish at all or streams. So we need to have um, nitrification process to convert ammonia into nitrites and nitrates. And in this um, nitrification process, we have um, bacteria such as the ammonia oxidizing bacteria, AOB, as well as the nitrite oxidizing bacteria, NOB, to help us convert uh, toxic ammonia into nitrites and nitrates. Among the significant uh, species of bacteria that are ammonia oxidizing are nitrosomonas and nitrosococcus species. And for nitrite oxidizing bacteria, we have nitrobacter species and nitrospira species. But the cycle cannot stop here because nitrates can also be toxic if the level becomes too high, uh, toxic to fish and uh, shrimps. So we need um, another process that's called denitrification, which converts nitrates into nitrogen gas. And denitrification. Uh, are often done uh, in anoxic conditions. Uh, and uh, this is uh, done by denitrifying bacteria such as Pseudomonas species and Acromobacter species. And um, if the processes are efficient, okay, a lot of um, your ammonial nitrite, nitrate waste will be converted into harmless nitrogen gas. So, in our studies, uh, we have set up experiments um, in fish tanks um, with objectives to assess bacterial diversity and water quality uh, and to cultivate denitrifying bacteria from bioflocks. 
So our water tanks are about 400 liters uh, in volume each, um, stocked with about 30 fish um, at a time. Um, and we do weekly measurements of the total ammonium nitrogen, nitrate, nitrite, alkalinity, pH, and temperature uh, to monitor the water quality and to um, assess the bacterial diversity in bioflock and also to cultivate denitrifying bacteria. We do microbiome analysis um, using DNA sequences. Um, and analysis is mainly based on 16S and precons. And also we um, isolate uh, bacteria on agar, um, agar um, media in the lab. Okay. So um, our results showed that um, in so far, uh, most of our tanks we have Uh, was a bit high early in the first few weeks, but then it stabilizes as well after fishes um, were added in to the tanks. Uh, nitrate also uh, stabilized and uh, pH is uh, within the range of um, neutral 7.6 to about 8 um, among the 11 weeks that we uh, monitor the tanks. And, and then um, for temperature, uh, not a lot of fluctuation as well between um, 27.5 to um, less than 29.5. And then alkalinity was also stable. And microbiome analysis um, showed we um, had mainly uh, bacilli, um, alpha photobacteria, actinomyces, Australia, gamma photobacteria as the top five abundant classes of um, bacteria. And as the um, diversity indexes showed uh, at the site, Shannon Weaver index um, were also stable. So meaning the diversity um, was stable, uh, whether uh, once the bioflock uh, has been established and uh, in the middle of the study, about day um, 17, 735, and at the end of the study, uh, day 49, 50, um, the diversity were more or less um, stable and similar. So um, stable bioflock means um, generally speaking, a uh, healthy culture of uh, fish and frogs. And moving on, uh, we tried uh, isolation uh, of Danish mine bacteria, and we were um, trying to get aerobic Danish mine bacteria. Um, in general, denitrification typically occurs under anaerobic conditions. Um, however, um, in practical terms, in the aquaculture, it is very difficult to have um, or to provide anaerobic conditions um, for denitrification to uh, happen uh, this way. So uh, if there are aerobic denitrifying bacteria uh, in the system, it will uh, help um, to carry out denitrification uh, even though there is a presence of oxygen because you always need to aerate uh, your water. Okay, So the aerobic denitrifying bacteria, also known as aerobic denitrifiers, can utilize oxygen while carrying out denitrification. And this is a very uh, beneficial um, element to have in uh, bioflock. So we managed to isolate um, two um, strains of uh, bacteria, which we put into a bacterial consortium. Um, 
that consists of the Lysini bacillus fusiformis, a gram-positive bacteria, and Pseudomonas stutzeri, a gram-negative uh, bacteria. And both of them um, can denitrify efficiently uh, within 24 hours, uh, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, medium um, when the media turns from yellow to blue it means they have um, carried out denitrification. So the benefits of using uh, aerobic nitrifying bacteria uh, in the biofox system is uh, one of the is uh, for water quality management and if you have um, high nitrates in your uh, system, you can add uh, these two bacteria uh, inside and uh, it will help to decrease uh, the nitrate in your water. Uh, and this will reduce You can also use like this uh, bacteria consortium in other Um, wastewater um, from agriculture or uh, not only just aquaculture. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much there, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Annie Tan. Okay, so apparently uh, your, uh, your part of research plays an important role in uh, basically what Dr. Pubalan project is doing. So um, in how, in what aspect basically on how your project can, your, your aspect of research can contribute to the overall your, of the IRG project basically, yeah, in uh, briefly. Um, briefly, um, we complement each other um, because we, we, I'm looking at the microbiological aspects uh, in the culture. So, Bioflock system is an important part uh, in this project uh, because all the tanks are using uh, Bioflock system. Um, so, we help to monitor that the Bioflocks are always stable. All right. So um, before we move on to the next speaker, I would like to thank you, Dr. Annie, once again, okay, for your time, for being with us today. We understand that you have a very busy schedule, okay, as one of the highly contributing academicians in the country. Thank you very much for your time. So if there is any question from the public, public will share, will share it with you later or other or your team members who might be able to answer the questions from our viewers. All right, Doctor? Thank you for having me. Really appreciate your time here. Thank you, Doctor. So now moving on to our next speaker, that is Dr. Noor Hidayah Muhammad Taufik. So Dr. Noor Hidayah Muhammad Taufik will be sharing with us today on exploring sustainable alternatives ingredients for aquaculture diets. So I would like to know more about all I know about when we talk about aquaculture diet, the chicken, the fish, the food for them, all I know is the duck. I'm sure everybody knows what is the duck. However, uh, Dr. Nur Hidayah is going to bring us deeper on better other alternatives when it comes to this duck. Over to you, Dr. Nur Hidayah. Are you ready? Dr. Nur Hidayah? Yes, I'm ready. Sorry for the unmute. Okay, no I'll problem. I'll share my screen now. All right, it's uh, all yours, doctor. All right, can you see my screen, right? Yes, clear. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you, Miss Valerie, for the introduction. Um, thank you for uh, inviting us today. So my topic for uh, today's sharing session is about exploring sustainable ingredients for aquaculture diets. So it's totally, it's kind of different than what we have uh, listened before by Dr. Pubalan and Dr. Aini. So before we move on to um, alternative ingredients,
okay, let, let's look at aquaculture production and why it is important to acknowledge the need for alternative feed ingredients in aquaculture. So um, actually we've been getting our seafood, okay, our protein source from both aquaculture and capture fisheries. And today, uh, like for the past 10 years, we've seen that aquaculture actually have the past production of capture fisheries. I mean, capture fisheries is when we, we uh, gather all the fisheries uh, products from, from the ocean or from the freshwater environment. But for aquaculture, we farm the fish ourselves. And uh, we've seen that um, the production of aquaculture have already surpassed capture fisheries as you can see from the figure below here. Okay, so um, this showed that how important aquaculture is and the protein that uh, it provides for the growing population that we have right now. So uh, currently we have more than 200 fat species. That means these species are farm species, it's not cultured, it's, it's not um, harvested, or captured, it's cultured of farm species all over the world. And that's, that shows how huge the industry is. Uh, all these fish, they, they require different types of feed because as fish nutritionists, we know that all of these fish have their own feeding requirements and not one size fits all. That means not one, pet, not one type of uh, feed can be fed to all these 200 species. They need to have their own uh, specific feed. So to grow them, okay, we require formulated feed or we call it pellet feed right now that we, we commonly use in farm, farm fish. So to ensure this aquaculture industry growing, we need a lot of, of, of this uh, feed. So that actually create opportunity and also problems at the same time. And why, why, why is it a problem? So a problem is because we identify that the cost of operation in, in fish farm is actually majorly influenced by fish feed. So that means um, based on the published paper by these this, uh, researchers here, Tong Sri et al. in 2021, uh, it shows that more than 50% of operation costs for aquaculture is actually coming from the feed. So uh, we need to ensure that the farmers get proper affordable feed for them to, to make profit. If they don't have access to affordable feed, they will not make profit and the aquaculture industry will not grow. So that actually is important to understand why the feed price keeps on increasing. Okay, so what actually makes feed expensive? Uh, there's a lot of factors, but one of the important factors is the high price of feed ingredients. So feed ingredients play important roles in um, contributing to the feed price. So right now we have three major ingredients that we use in aquaculture feed. And um, we have seen this ingredients price hiking over the decades. And the first one is like uh, the fish meal. The okay, fish meal is... Uh, source from wild caught fish. That means uh, it's from the marine uh, fish, marine organism. So we harvest them and then process them into fish meal. So these fish meal are not sustainably produced. So uh, if you can see from the figure here from 2003 until 2023, around 20 years, we have seen that fish meal price has grown exponentially about 200%. And the prices will keep on uh, expecting to increase further in the future. Another two ingredients are crops that we, uh, is the commodity crops like corn and soybean. Those ingredients are imported crops. So we've been relying on these imported crops for decades. It's pretty cheap when we import them, but uh, it will not be a sustainable options in the future because we already see the impact during the COVID and uh, with the conflict of Russia and Ukraine, we see how increase, how it increased tremendously for the past uh, three years, the price of these uh, commodity crops. 
And uh, all these grains uh, actually are imported and we, we are not producing them in Malaysia. However, we are right now we are trying to uh, grow corn for, for livestock, but the amount of production is still limited. So um, what can we do? Okay, what can we do to reduce this feed price? As a nutritionist, uh, these are some of my suggestions. Uh, first of all, of course, we need to adopt a best feeding practice in the farm. Okay, we have to ensure that the, the farmers, they, they really understand how to feed their fish well, the optimum feed they need to, to uh, supply to the feed, to, to their fish of interest, because all fish, as I mentioned earlier, all fish species, they have their own feeding requirement, right? So the farmers need to understand that and make sure not to waste the feed. So that's the first thing. Another major uh, way to, to try to reduce the feed price is to understand or to find alternative ingredients that can replace these conventional ingredients that we have right now. And um, it's about alternative ingredients. We have lots of alternative ingredients available that have been well studied, thousands, I would guess. And uh, here I've, I've listed four types of ingredients that we commonly used in aquaculture feed, uh, either to replace or, or as supplement for, for, the, uh, for aquaculture feed. So the first one is plant protein. Plant protein source, for example, um, the grains, the cereals, the leafy materials, all that is considered under plant protein source, uh, like soybean, corns, all that. Um, and then vertebrates proteins. Vertebrates proteins are those from slaughterhouse. That means from animal byproducts like poultry byproducts, blood meals, feather meals. We process it into protein source. And then we also have single cell protein. Uh, these are from microorganisms, typically from fungi, yeast, algae, um, bacteria, and then invertebrates protein like insects. Uh, polycytes, crustaceans, like uh, if you know shrimp waste, shrimp waste is under uh, invertebrates protein as well. So there's a lot of ingredients. And um, as a fish nutritionist, our lab have been working with these alternative in ingredients. Uh, we have been exploring a lot of potential ingredients available locally uh, for the past 10 years. And uh, we currently there's ongoing projects and projects that we have uh, finished like uh, for example we have work working with uh, insects particularly crickets uh, black soldier fly and then we also have uh, micro algae like spirulina and then mushrooms uh, byproducts of mushrooms any uh, biological compound extracted from mushrooms as well as um, seaweeds red algae and there are also various fish species that we are also uh, working, working on right now, uh, like tilapia, sea bass, jade perch, uh, so catfish, and so on. And here's some of our publications from our lab on, on the potential ingredients that we have tested that I've mentioned earlier on fish. Um, regarding the, the jade perch uh, on, for the RIRG project, uh, so we have tested this uh, fish, this jade perch that have been mentioned earlier by Dr. Pubale and Dr. Ini. Um, we test this jade perch where we feed them with black soldier fly meal. And uh, we've, we've seen a very promising results where this fish is an omnivorous. So they can accept both plant protein and also insects-based protein. And uh, it's very well uh, results. Actually, the result is, is promising, and um, we found that this fish can accept partially replacement of fish meal with this uh, black soldier fly. Uh, and we there is a lot of a lot that need to be studied. Uh, and I would also like to thank our student Hayati, who, who are a graduate student here working in this project, uh, and dedicated her time to, to conduct this research. So um, 
what actually, what does the future of feed in aquaculture looks like? And we have seen that um, increasing interest towards alternative ingredients, particularly insects meal on feed industry for the past um, two, three years, especially towards the end of COVID, when, when all the price of feed, all the animal products actually increase in, in price. So I foresee that this trend will grow exponentially in the future. And um, some of big players in feed manufacture uh, already started invest, investing in insect meal uh, industry, like, like uh, Cargill here. So I believe that in Malaysia, we have the right condition to meet the demand from end to end, uh, or at least for ourselves to produce these insects. Uh, and commercialize it. And I hope that's, uh, that's the future of aquaculture feed that we will move to it. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Back to you, Ms. Get, uh, Valerie. Thank you very much there, Dr. Norhidaya. So looking at so many fishes this morning makes me feel like having steamed fish for, to, for dinner tonight. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much there. Okay, so we would like to move on to our next slot. We are going to give the opportunity to our speakers this morning. So uh, let's begin with Associate Professor Engineer Dr. Poo Balan to uh, sum up his presentation before we proceed to our Q&A session at the end of the summary. So, Dr. Pubalan, are you there? Uh, yes, uh, thank you again. Okay. Uh, okay, as a summary from my side, uh, where I emphasize on uh, aeration technology. So again, I would like to stress out that the selection uh, criteria of the aeration technology is very important. Uh, in order to improve your productivity or of the yield, or whatever you are producing now. So the right selection is very important. Uh, please consider of using a recent technologies like uh, nano or micro bubble, uh, in which you can use in a hybrid mode if you don't want to use fully because of the cost of the electricity or cost of investment. You can also consider to use in hybrid mode. Uh, which uh, bring the meaning of uh, you may uh, uh, you may introduce that uh, aeration in a particular hours of your culture. For example, maybe after the feeding, uh, whereby after the feeding, the, uh, the DO, DO means the dissolved oxygen of the tank will go down because of the feeding and the fish consume the food, more uh, BOD will be, uh, the oxygen demand will be increased. And that particular, maybe for a period of uh, one hour, you may uh, introduce this micro or nano bubble aeration and this will be significantly improve the productivity of your farming. Uh, thank you. Back to you, madam. Thank you, Dr. Pubalan. Um, so, all right, so now let's move on to Dr. Nor Hidaya. So Dr. Nihoidaya, we actually have a question, but we'll get back to you. We have a question for you, but we'll proceed uh, with your summarization first before we explore further in your area because we have some interest from the public. So over to you first, Dr. Nihoidaya. Okay, thank you, Ms. Valerie. So basically, as I've mentioned earlier, aquaculture is one of the fastest growing uh, animal production industry right now. And Thanks to the production of fish pellet, we, we can see that we can cater the growing demand. Because of this pellet feed, they are formulated. They contain nutrients that are optimized according to the fish uh, nutrient requirement. So to ensure that the pellet actually have good nutrient, we need to use multiple ingredients to get the balanced diets. Similar as us, we cannot just rely on single source of ingredients to grow, right? So the fish also require the same thing. They, they need different multiple ingredients to have the balanced diet for themselves to grow. So um, the commercial feed that we have right now is still relying on various imported commodity ingredients like fish meal, soy, and corn that I've mentioned earlier. And we need to at least reduce its inclusion in aqua feed. 
And to do that, we need to acknowledge the, the use of alternative ingredients like insects, male, single cell protein, agriculture byproducts, that especially that we could culture or find locally here in Malaysia. And um, I would also like to highlight here that although we have all these ingredients, we we still need to make sure that the ingredients should be cost efficient, not only cost efficient, but also eco-friendly, sustainably to, to use. And uh, with that, we can improve our, our food security. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Noor Hidayah. So our first question, uh, sorry, uh, we, I apologize for, for the glitch. So uh, we have Dr. Annie with us at the moment. Okay, so Dr. Yes. Randy, uh, so you would like to summarize on your presentation earlier before we proceed to the Q&A session? Okay, so um, to summarize, um, the Bioflock system is uh, very cost-effective, sustainable and environmentally friendly um, system for aquaculture. And Application in aquaculture uh, is expected to contribute towards the human food security. So benefits of system uh, using aerobic denitrifying uh, bacteria uh, include water quality management where we maintain optimal water quality by reducing nitrate levels. We also reduce environmental impact of aquaculture operations, um, increase stocking density, which in turn improves uh, productivity and profitability in aquaculture operations, enhance biosecurity, uh, because in uh, recirculating aquaculture systems uh, where water is continuously recycled and treated, maintaining good water quality is crucial for preventing spread of diseases and pathogens. So by maintaining stable water parameters, uh, including the bioflow. Um, overall health of the aquaculture system and the cultured fish or stream can be improved. And finally, last but not least, nutrient recycling and resource efficiency is also uh, improved because um, aerobic denitrifying bacteria plays a very important role in nutrient recycling within the aquaculture systems. And this promotes resource efficiency and reduces the need for additional nitrogen inputs such as synthetic fertilizers or feed supplements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Annie, for the summary. All right, so our first question, we have a very good question, goes to our fish nutritionist. Okay, I like that term. It sounds very cute. Our fish nutritionist, nutritionist Dr. Nohidayah Muhammad Taufik. Okay, so um, a question from, from the public is that, Dr. Nohidayah, are the ingredients studied ready for commercialization? Okay, um, yeah. ingredients, what kind of ingredients are you referring to? So there's a lot of alternative ingredients here. So in, in my case, I, I'm studying insects male, particularly black soldier fly. So if I can give you the case of black soldier fly, these in insects, um, there is a growing interest of, grow, uh, of culturing or producing these insects in large scale. But right now, the price is actually very competitive. Uh, it's still fairly a little bit expensive than fish meal. But I, we can see that the price actually going down uh, over the years because as we, as we can produce it in large scale, uh, we can reduce the price. That means we can, uh, the, the product already achieved the economies of scale. So once it achieved the economies of scale, we can have a competitive price for this product and we can commercialize it. So at the moment, um, this, like is a black soldier fly, they can replace fish meal. Um, and then fish meal, the price is going to grow, is going to increase uh, every year. It's not going to drop. So we can, we can predict that over the time, once we get um, a good technology to grow this, this BSF in large scale, uh, and uh, we have some, some, some uh, 
companies, okay, large companies already who have been growing this in or using automated system and so on, they can produce ton tonnage of uh, insects meal right now. And the price is also uh, going to be competitive and, 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 and lower. So I, I believe that after this, once we get the we, we get the technology to improve the scale of the production, we can commercialize it in the future. Yes. I hope I, I answered that, uh, the, the question. All right, sure. We are going to share the email contact details of our panelists today. So if any of the general viewers are interested to keep in touch with our speaker to discuss further or to explore opportunities where you can work together, please feel free to do so. So now we have another question for our uh, Dr. Pubalan. So Dr. Pubalan, the question is, what is the prospect of jade perch aquaculture in Malaysia, given that it is a non-native species? So over to you, Dr. Pubalan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam. Uh, regarding the uh, jade perch, uh, we have a local breeder. Uh, she's a local breeder. Uh, I can't remember now. Uh, there's a uh, where she sells a uh, breed. Breed is the first step. Getting a breed at a competitive uh, price is the first step. Uh, however, compared to the other fishes like tilapia, uh, jade perch breed, uh, I mean, the seed itself is a bit pricey. And then the market for now, it's a bit uh, uh, not as, as big as the tilapia fish. So I would not say, I would say that uh, it is a growing market rather than, uh, rather than a big market for now. However, it is getting popular now. People getting to know about this fish, uh, the, the healthy content of it. Uh, hopefully, we have a more demand. Uh, as, uh, as, as we have more demand, the price, uh, the, all the costing will become better. Uh, that's all from me, ma'am. Madam. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. Another question. So we still have a bit of time, about uh, less than ten minutes. So this one is. Uh, let's go get more serious on this. So, um, what is the present state of development on technology readiness? level the trl of this aeration technology developed at um level so currently we are at trl six or seven right doctor so yes. what is your view on this ah uh, yes as uh, as just to reiterate what you said so as from uh, from our um side the technology of the aeration as i have come to a point where we are at uh, trl uh, six or seven where we already proved the concept we tested uh, the technology. The it is uh, it's uh, performing very well. So we are now looking for uh, upscaling to a commercial scale, uh, whereby we can uh, apply it in a bigger farming or bigger ponds. Uh, for that, we are, I'm uh, I mean uh, looking for more greater fund or some industry takers, whereby we can uh, uh, upscale the technology for real uh, big commercial scale of farming. Thank you, madam. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pubalan. So let's go back to Dr. Nor Hidayah. Okay, so this might be our final questions. Then uh, what is what are the challenges at the moment of using these alternative ingredients compared to conventional ingredients that we currently have in the industry or market? So um, we have a lot of ingredients and uh, referring again to like black like soldier fly, uh, one of the challenge, a lot of challenge actually, but one of it is the, of course, cost. Uh, it's actually pretty easy to culture it. We can use any type of organic materials to, to grow them. Uh, it's just that the process, okay, the techniques to grow that actually require labor. and then. Um, and then the nutritional value, the nutritional content of the insects is also uh, relatively correlated with the sub substrates that we use. So in order for us to <clears throat> reduce the price of the ingredients, we have to use 
um, substrates that is economical and practical for us uh, to grow them. So any, any type of organic waste uh, from agriculture byproducts, we can use it. Um, and actually those substrates will influence the nutritional composition of that uh, insects. And, and that will actually uh, influence the, the final output of the pellet. So if we grow these insects with um, high oil, okay, high lipid content, it will actually um, reduce the quality of the feed. So we need to we need to have some pre-processing before we use it for the for the uh, fish pellet. So that's actually a technical challenge that we need to mitigate first uh, before we we proceed using this this insects or these alternative ingredients that, that we have right now. All right. So uh, I hope you don't mind if there is another opportunity for me to proceed with one more question, Dr. Nohidaya. Yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, in terms of your cost and economic factor, right, especially looking at it, is it cost effective when utilizing these alternative ingredients like black soldier fly for aquaculture feed compared to using the current conventional uh, materials? Um, so this uh, black soldier fly, as I've uh, mentioned earlier, it depends on the availability and uh, this availability is actually depends on the methods that we grow them, the substrates. Um, yeah, all that actually influence the cost of the production. So if we want to have a good competitive price, we have to acknowledge all these factors first. Uh, then only we can proceed it proceed to include that as, as feed materials in, in uh, uh, fish feed. Because fish actually, we have like different types of fish. Uh, we have carnivores, her herbivores, omnivores, and all these fish, they require different percentage of uh, black soldier fly in the diet. So that actually um, influence the cost as well. So uh, yeah, I would suggest um, uh, what I can, I can um, mention here is we can proceed uh, with the insects meal as long as we have a good uh, support by all multi stakeholders here, not just the farmers, but also the government, the industries all together joining hands. And then we can we can proceed with having this alternative ingredients as uh, part of fish feed. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for the answer, Dr. Nor Hidayah. So uh, that marks the end of our session. So we have shared the contact details, the emails of our speaker today. Should you have any interest approaching any of our speakers for further collaboration or just to get them involved because our general publics are our stakeholders. It is our responsibility in University Malaya to share our knowledge and to transfer the technology to the society. So with that, we would like to thank you our speakers, Dr. Pubalan, Dr. Nor Hidayah and Dr. Annie Tan for taking the time and effort sharing your knowledge and your research findings with us today. So with that, I would like to thank you, our general public who are not from UM. Do we have any viewers from outside University Malaya or other states? Please state in the comment so that we can keep in touch. Don't forget to fill up the feedback form, the link, so that we can keep you updated on any of our future activities. And who knows, we can work together in other aspects in the future. All right, signing off. My name is Valerie Casera, the moderator for this session today. Thank you and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor.